Um, I just, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, give the Lord a thanks for what he's already done. I can't believe what he's done in this, this year. Uh, when Brian Espy and I used to talk about this and dream about this, uh, uh, and then others came along and the vision got bigger, and, and then God did it. I, I, I can't say anything except that he did it. And I, I, they asked me tonight to just kind of explain to you the mission and the vision of this ministry. So the purpose of me speaking is I want to clearly articulate that. Second, I don't want to bore you to death, so my wife is going to keep me honest if I get boring. And Robin is going to keep me honest if I get too long. So, so uh, we're going to get you out on time. But when I was thinking about what we do on this mobile unit... And I was thinking about what I would say. Uh, something recently happened to me that, that reminds me of, of why we do what we do. Um, my wife and I have been married 25 years. And um, a friend of mine, Price Bishop, who's here, was gracious enough to let us stay in his condo out in Deer Valley in Utah. It was really nice. Camille and I were having a great time. It was 68 and sunny in the middle of August. It was a beautiful time. We were having a very romantic time together and enjoying it. But there was a mountain that just kept calling my name and it was on the mountain in the summer it's not a ski slope that you can take the ski lifts to the top and ride these mountain bikes these extreme mountain bikes down the mountain now, now one thing you know if you're 49 years old 49 and extreme don't really go together and I, I, I told my wife I said I have got to ride my bike on that mountain now Camille reminded me smartly that my physical therapist who works on my back three times a year said do not go up on that mountain. She told me specifically not to climb the mountain. I told her later that it's her fault that my back was doing so well that I had to ride the mountain bike. But anyway, I finally commit, convinced Camille to let me, and so I signed up, and I, and I had another warning. God sent me a second warning, and it was the three-page legal waiver that I had to sign <laughs> before I got on the mountain bike. So I, I started signing the waiver. You know, you can break your arm. You can break your neck. And you had the initial. I felt like I was buying a house. You you know, you can get paralyzed, you can die. And so I signed all this, real happy, gave the guy the thing and paid my, my money. And, and then they said, well, you need to get in line for your armor. And I said, armor? I'm just riding a bicycle. I, I got to put armor. So they gave me breastplate and arm pads and, and leg pads from head to toe and, and a motorcycle helmet for a helmet, which is not your usual bike helmet. And that should have been a warning. So I got to the ski lift, and I had my bike, and I was all happy, and I felt really good. The weather was good. I felt young, and I got on it, and it was the best 18 minutes of mountain biking I've ever done. It's unbelievable. And then I, I got in a, a difficult turn, stuck my foot out, and I broke my leg. Well, when it happened, my leg was crunchy and all waving around, and I knew, I knew immediately what I'd done, and I'm at the top of the mountain. And so I'm like, man, what am I going to do? You know, and I'm laying there and hoping somebody will come along because I went by myself. And, and, and thank God he sent somebody not too long after that. And they, and they called ahead and got a rescue unit to come up and rescue me. Now, I've never been rescued. That's, that's the only time I've ever had to be rescued. And it's very humbling. You know, they come up to you and you're laying there and I, I couldn't do anything. They had to put me on a board and put me in the back of this rescue unit and they drove me back down the mountain. Now, I, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of these guys that like to enjoy my life, so I almost took a selfie of me <laughs> in, in the rescue thing. It was just, just kind of surreal to be rescued. Well, I had surgery, and, and I'm doing better now, but, but I started thinking, you know, while I was recovering, I, I started thinking about being rescued and what it means to be rescued. And then I thought, well, I'm going to rent some movies. So I rented Save It and Private Ryan and watched one of the greatest rescue movies ever made. And I watched the movie The Guardian with Kevin Costner. It's a great rescue movie about the Coast Guard. And, and then I got online. I said, well, I wonder if there's any real-life rescues that would be interesting to read about. So I Googled top ten rescues ever. And a rescue story came up that really was intriguing to me, and it was a rescue called The Great Raid. And if you know anything about World War II, you know about the Great Raid. But I want to share with you all a little bit about the Great Raid in some detail because I think it, 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 it relates to what we're doing. You know, in, in, in 1941, they bombed Pearl Harbor, destroyed our naval presence in the Pacific. And 10 hours later, they attacked 
the Philippine Islands where we had 72,000 of our troops on that island. Our troops were unprotected because they didn't have the Navy to protect them. And we had to surrender after three to four months of fighting. And we surrendered all of our soldiers on that island. Well, the Japanese were ruthless in the way they cared for their prisoners of war. In fact, they, they, they didn't have enough facility to handle that many, so they, they began to systematically execute POWs. In fact, that's where we get the Bataan Death March. They took these men, they marched them on the Bataan Death March, and thousands died along the way. And they do horrible things, like they would run over our men with the Jeep and just keep running over them until they were crushed like roadkill while their comrades had to walk by and see their buddy on the middle of the street. It was horrible. And they marched these men, and they split them up to three POW camps, and the largest one was called Cabanatuan. Cabanatuan. I'm, I'm southern. It may be some other pronunciation, but it's called Cabanatuan. And it was the largest POW camp, and they were merciless at this camp. Well, MacArthur, who had, um, who had retreated, vowed to come back to the Philippines. And he did. Once we gained enough force, he came back to the Philippines and he was going to take the island, which he ultimately did. But they realized that if they stormed in and just took the island, the Japanese would just ex execute all of our POWs. And that was so distasteful to him. He said, we got to rescue our men before we come, but it's got to be so covert that it doesn't alert the Japanese that we're coming. And we're going to come in five days. So we got five days to plan how to rescue these POWs. So they appointed a a Colonel Musi. Now, Colonel Musi is an interesting guy because he spent the entire three years of the war training 121 army men. Now, these army men never had seen battle. These were men from the Midwest, most of them farmers. But in the, in the war, they were put in charge of the horses and the various livestock. But then he would train them to be special forces. And that was before ranger school. So to be a ranger, you just got designated one because you were bad, I guess. But they took those guys, and they trained them. And he said, we got the right group for this. These men will do it. But it was certain death. I mean, they were going to have to go in with 121 men. They had to march 30 miles across the island undetected. Then they had to attack a POW camp that had between 250 and 500 Japanese soldiers that was two miles from a camp where there was over 10,000 Japanese and tanks. So it was certain death. In fact, Colonel Musi said to his men, and this is just one of those great American stories, he said to his men, this is volunteer. If you don't want to go, go home. And they all stayed. And then he said, there will be no atheist on this trip. If you're an atheist, go home. Now, and you can't say that anymore, can you? But he did. And then they took them all and they began to pray because they knew it was going to have to be one of those miraculous rescues. And then they, he appointed a man named Captain Robert Prince because he, was, he had a lot of ingenuity and he could think outside the box. And he appointed him to plan the rescue. So with the aid of some intelligence they obtained, he, he planned a daring rescue. Now, there were several problems. They had to hike the 30 miles I already told you about, each man carrying only a knife, a pistol, and a rifle. And they gave four men a bazooka. Each, they had four bazookas because there were tanks that they were going to have to take out. So each of those guys would take out the tanks. Now, that's a lot of odds. But it made it worse because when they got to the camp, there was a 700-yard perimeter around the camp that was nothing but a field. The Japanese had burned all the foliage so that they could see anyone that would sneak up on them. And they needed a distraction. And a pilot raised his hand. I love pilots. I love pilots. I got a pilot at my table. These guys, these guys will do anything. And he said, I'll be the distraction. A guy named Schreibner. And he took his airplane and he flew over the, the concentration camp 30 feet high, over and over and over and dipping back and forth and he asked them how many minutes do you need to get across that 700 yards they say we need 20 minutes he said I'll give you 20 minutes and he flew over that repeatedly and distracted them just enough that those men got in position in full perimeter around the the POW camp and there was a signal there was a, a sniper and when everybody was in place the sniper was to take out the tallest tower and that would signal everybody else to start shooting and in 15 seconds our men took out all the guards all the way around. 
And then they opened fire on their barracks because the men were eating dinner. They went at dinner time. They even figured out when they would be most concentrated. Wiped out 250 Japanese soldiers. Two of our men were lost. One of them was a doctor. It gives me some, I mean, if I go to battle, I don't know how I'm going to do. But two men were lost. It was the greatest rescue in our military history. It, it goes down as one of the greatest rescues. And I started thinking, that's what we do. We just, we just run around with a great rescue plan and heroes and we rescue babies. That's what we do. We rescue moms. You know, you know, in any great epic rescue story, there's three characters. There's the victim. There's the hero. And there's lots of bystanders. I want to talk about the victim. You know, having been a victim, it's pretty vulnerable laying there with a broke leg and you can't get off a mountain. Those POWs that were trapped in that POW camp were vulnerable, unable to do anything for themselves. They were, they, they, they were in, in a terrible position. They were even felt forgotten. They called themselves ghost soldiers. And the reason they did, because they were, they were alive yet, yet dead. And they called themselves ghost soldiers. It, 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 they were helpless. You know, our victim, we actually, we actually have three victims in our fight for life. The first victim's obvious. 1973, our government stripped our most vulnerable citizen of all its rights and privileges even the right to life. Our victim has no voice. Our victim can't speak. Our victim is completely helpless. And we've opened, opened, opened a door to just wiping them out. We've had, had over 30 million abortions in, in America since Roe v. Wade. Unless you think that's just out there, I mean, we, we, we get eight or 900 of them a year here in Montgomery at our abortion clinic. You know, we have an abortion clinic, 38, 39 years, faithfully aborting babies. They take Christmas off. I always think that's comical, but they do. You know, we, it's a helpless victim. But that's not the only victim. You know, the parents are victimized. The mother and father who, who are lied to when they say, this will take away your problem. It doesn't. It sears her heart. You know, if you talk to a woman that's had an abortion, she'll tear up. It could have been 20 years ago. And she'll tear up like it happened yesterday. You know, only the gospel of Christ can heal her heart. And he can. And he does. But it's a painful scar that she keeps. She's a victim. You know, the, the abortion industry is all about money. If it wasn't about money, they'd do it for free. 700 bucks a pop up downtown to get an abortion. You know, that it's all about the money. They exploit these women. They're the victim. But there's a third victim, our society at large. You know, I, I, I was born in 1968 when, when I was five years old, Roe v. Wade was handed down. And so I've never really known an America where life was not cheap. You know, that cheapened life. When you can just murder a baby if it's inconvenient, that cheapened life. So I've never known an America where life wasn't cheap. Well, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And, th and then we have any wonder why there's shootings and stabbings and, and horrible outcries. But, you know, if life is not worth anything, that's the logical next step. You know, the two greatest sins of this nation are slavery and abortion. The two greatest legalized sins in our country. And we still suffer from slavery. And we're going to continue to suffer from this until we can... We can, we can Get this out of our nation. And this is one way you can do it. In other words, victims. But there's heroes. Robin just sat down and told you what all's happening. There's a lot of heroes in this room. Bethany Garth is here from First Choice. Elmore County Pregnancy Center. Cope, Lori Mullins. I saw Lori. Um, River Region Pregnancy Center. There's a lot of heroes. And in this room, there's a lot of heroes who are willing to take a stand for life. And we got a plan. It's a good plan. It, it, a year ago, Brian and I, when we were just thinking about this thing two years ago, we didn't know. We just said, Lord, I think you want a mobile unit here. And God has done an amazing thing. Greg from um, ICU Mobile is here, our, our, the uh, national director. Greg, can you stand up? If you, 
Greg is from, from Ohio. He came down and is staying here. He came just for this tonight, and he is the director of ICU Mobile, the whole fleet. We're one of 44 in his fleet. He's a hero. You know, um, in this room, if you were invited tonight, somebody thought you were a hero. Because when we sat down as a board, we said, invite heroes. Invite people who you think can make a difference. Invite people who you think might stand up for life. And you were invited. That means that somebody thought you were heroic and could be a part of a great rescue plan. You know, there's bystanders in any great epic rescue, people that stand by and watch. That's an interesting crowd, the people that watch. It's, it's, it's a mixed crowd. There's multiple reasons to be a bystander. In fact, I, I think it's the easiest character to be in the whole drama is the bystander. It costs you nothing to be a bystander. It's free. You don't have to have any character to be a bystander. You just stand. You, know, you don't have to be brave to be a, a bystander. That's the easiest character to be. And when I started thinking about, well, why is the Christian church, the majority of the Christian church, and I'm talking mostly to Christians here tonight, I think, why are we bystanding? And there's a lot of reasons for it, I think. Some are standing by out of ignorance. They don't know we have an abortion clinic downtown that does almost 1,000 abortions a year. They don't know that abortion is the greatest evil in our country right now. Maybe they don't know. But I think the larger group of bystanders know, but they don't care enough to do anything. Call that complacent. Those are the complacent bystanders. Now, yeah, they vote pro-life. If I ask any one of you, every one of us would say we're pro-life. If I ask any of my Christian brothers, they'd say pro-life. And they even speak up for it when we're at church. But what are they willing to sacrifice? David Day and his friends and the screws and several that have, that have been out there at the front line for years, years, calling for women to, to keep their babies. There's some heroes here. They're not bystanding. John Klein and several others. There's a lot of people here that are heroes. But a lot of us have bystanders. I was a bystander. Um, when we got ready to do this, uh, I knew there was abortion clinic in Montgomery, but I'm embarrassed to tell you I didn't know where it was. I had to Google, so I Googled the abortion clinic, drove down there. I said, well, if we're going to get a bus, I better know where we're parking. So I went down there to see where we were going to park. Um, and I'm an OBGYN. I know better than that. I was a bystander. I think I thought it was too big a battle. Let me tell you how likely this is to win this battle. You know, this mobile unit is a rolling truth unit. There's 44 of them in our fleet, and... And I'm praying for 200 of them. Now, when Wilberforce took slavery out of England, he went to Parliament. They did nothing, as we have gone to our government, and they've done nothing. But when he went to the people, and he exposed the evil of slavery, and he showed the people how horrible it is what is happening to those slaves so they can have sugar cubes in their tea. The English people cried out from the grassroots to get that out of, their, out of their land. Now, imagine we've been doing this, and we just started. I, I think our numbers will be better next year. We're, we're learning to fish. Okay, We call this fishing. We, we take this mobile unit, and we'll park it anywhere. We'll go anywhere. If we're not catching fish here, we'll move to somewhere where we're catching fish. We're looking for girls in crisis. Spend four days a week in front of the abortion clinic. We go anywhere. And my favorite story, i got to tell you this favorite story. Am I going too long? Who's supposed to be keeping up? My favorite story, when we first got started, this is my favorite story. We were up in Elmore County, and a girl was going to come to the Elmore County Pregnancy Center and get an ultrasound. She was in a crisis. She didn't know what she was going to do. She couldn't get a ride to the Elmore County and called the unit crying. You know, we have a cell phone on the unit. You can call that cell phone. It's a hotline. And she called the cell phone and said to our people, I can't come. I don't know what I'm going to do. And Dana, 
and Amanda looked at each other. I think it's Dana and Amanda. Who was there? I think it's Dana and Patsy. Patsy Tassoff and Dana looked at each other. Where do you live? <laughs> and she said, I, I live in Santuck. And she said, well, we'll be up there in 15 minutes. They drove to Santuck, met her in the parking lot of the First Chad Baptist Church at Santuck, showed her her baby, and she trusted. Uh, I, I think, I don't know, she, she, she presented the gospel to her too. I can't. But anyway, she kept her baby. It was just one of those great, we make house calls. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just fun. And, and so, and then every girl that we, that we are able to show them the baby, you know, 89.1% of girls will, they'll cancel their abortion if they just see their own child. It just, it touches their heart. You know, the Bible says, in Psalm 139, you created my inmost being. You knit me together inside my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. When she sees that, it's a game changer. It changes everything. Robin's right. We don't spend any time talking about it. We just kind of just get to know them, love on them, and show them the ultrasound and wait and see what's going to happen. You know, it's always good. So tonight, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to go ahead and conclude by telling you what happened to those brave men who rescued those POWs. You know, Robert Prince was an apple farmer. That's what he did for a living. He was an apple farmer when he, was, when he enlisted. And he got through with the war and he went back to being an apple farmer. And he married his sweetheart and they raised two boys. He loved one woman for 52 years until she died. He was given uh, multiple accolades and awards and was ultimately inducted into the Ranger Hall of Fame. Now, you imagine how many warriors are in that Hall of Fame. Musi did the same thing. He lived it late into his 80s. You know how Musi died? He died because he was swimming in the surf outside his, ocean, outside his house and broke his hip and died of, of hip complications at 86. This is an awesome man, a great American hero. You know, but neither one of them were anything particularly special. They just, they just caught a vision for what they were made to do, and they did it. So in this room, we're praying for 100 heroes. 100 heroes. Men and women who will stand up for life and get involved in what we're doing in some way. It, it takes a little bit of money to run this thing, and um, Robin's going to share with you a little bit about that. It's worth it. So I'm asking you to be a hero with us tonight. Thank you.